It says, according to the information president, it says, person she's spoken public about her or husband's extraordinary intersection. Up here, we've got that. McDonald's slight view of her seat. It's all there. <laughs> she's a perfectionist. CNN anchor. Hold it. Getting those lights. I mean, if you're not going to be handsome, you got to go to the level of Andrew Wheel, right? The uh, alternative medicine guy from Harvard. Oh, yeah. Is everybody ready? 30 seconds. Just a couple of quick announcements before we get started on our fireside chat. Um, David uh, Serrata's presentation will be the last presentation in this room, track two, and it may get started a little late. Also, Hami Masan will get started a little later, around possibly no later than 3.40 in the next room, um, because the schedule, as you know, is running just a little behind, but we're going to make up for it in extremely rich, rich content. And um, today we're so fortunate to have Betsy McDonald here. Um, originally scheduled in this time frame was Ann Druffel, the author of Firestorm, Dr. Uh, James McDonald's fight for UFO science. Um, unfortunately, she could not be here today. She hurt her shoulder and was unable to fly, so she's terribly disappointed and sends her regrets and uh, good wishes for um, a replacement panel here today. But one door opens when another closes, as you know. Attending our conference this year, we're so honored to have the widow of Dr. McDonald, Dr. James McDonald, Betsy McDonald. She graduated from uh, UC Berkeley in 1942, joined the Navy in World War II, where she met James McDonald at MIT while studying meteorology. They married in 1945. They had six children. She is a civil libertarian, anti-war activist, and socialist, and has many stories along those lines as well. But um, she is an amazing person. This is the first time that Betty McDonald has spoken publicly about her husband's extraordinary intersection with the power issues mm -hmm. that this conference addresses, and I should say the uh, issues that both of them addressed. We've chosen to couch this format in the form of a fireside chat. Thought you would enjoy that. The only thing we're missing is a fireside, so, but we have enough fire in the room to make up for that. And uh, this will be focused on the legacy of Jim McDonald. Betsy will be joined by Stanton Friedman, Brian Chrissy, the publisher of Firestorm, and Stephen Bassett, who will moderate this wonderful special discussion. So without further ado, I turn it over to Stephen Bassett. Thank you, Cheryl. Doesn't she do a wonderful job? She's a prof professional, believe me. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is really uh, amazing. Um, I had no idea that that would happen this way. I do feel very bad for Anne. She really, really wanted to be here. Um, as you know from last year, those of you who were here, I, I read that book. I don't get a chance to read many books, and I, I get, I've got hundreds of them. They're coming in all the time. I read that one for some reason, and it had enormous impact on me because this, this was a story that cut to the heart of this 57-year period. And so Anne came out and talked about it at the last X conference, and we invited her again, and we invited Betsy to join us, and she was ha happy to come, and Anne couldn't make it. And Betsy sort of got a little rambunctious and said, hmm, maybe we could talk a little ourselves, you know? And so we've added some people here to do that, all right? So uh, I'm gonna get this off by asking, you know, a couple of questions. Stanton has personal experience with, with both uh, uh, Betsy and her husband, and of course, Brian Chrissy knows much more about the book in, in greater detail than I do. But let me, let me ask the first question, Betsy. You have watched all of this go on for the full 57 years, from 47 on, and you watched it from the perspective of an activist, someone that was out there engaging the issues, right? Um, and many of them unpopular at the time. So you've seen that happen. Of course, you understand the history of your husband and all of this, and then you've seen the aftermath for 30 more years. What, what is your sense about this emerging group of people with this, with this extraordinary interest. How, how do you see it? Well, I'm very Im <laughs> Well, I'm very impressed. 
um, in the very early. Okay. Okay. In in the very early days, I didn't see the caliber of the people that I see here. Oh, okay. I, I didn't see the caliber. Um, it seemed like, for me, I was a skeptic myself and very doubtful. It seemed to me like some of the other people that spoke were kooks. I'm sorry to say it. <laughs> but, um, but I don't see that here. Uh, next question. I'm going to ask Stanton a question. Stanton had an intersection with this. Uh, over the, in a history here, and I thought maybe he would uh, elaborate. By the way, he also has a uh, front comment in this book. Uh, Stanton, tell us a little bit about uh, how you uh, interacted with uh, Dr. McDonald. We had a very active group of researchers in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, back in the late 60s. We'd originally been a NICAP subcommittee, National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. Then we went on our own because we didn't like to be pushed around by Don Kehoe. So we set up our own group, and it was a, a bunch of us worked for Westinghouse, some of us worked for other companies in town. It was all professional people. And we established a good rapport with the media, and I don't know who made the original contact with Jim, but he would stop by on his way from Washington or someplace else. And he spoke at Westinghouse one time. He met with our group. He gave us permission to use his paper, uh, UFOs, the greatest scientific problem of our time. And around the uh, work table of the biggest accounting firm in Pittsburgh, downtown on the umpteenth floor of a building there, we all assembled a 1,000 copies of that, which he allowed us to sell so we could make enough money to afford a 24-hour answering service and things like that. And Jim was a model for us. Uh, we weren't, well, one of the guys was an academic, but the rest of us weren't. And we were galvanized by his willingness to dig into things. He checked things out first. He met with Kehoe, he checked his investigations, they looked solid. He met with other people, he went to Project Blue Book, was astonished to find that there was so much good material there. And he had the guts to speak out when most other people wouldn't. He spoke to the American Association of Newspaper Editors, some title like that, here in, in Washington, down the road, and caused quite a stir down there. One of the things that characterized Jim was his willingness to use his knowledge of atmospheric physics to treat the explanation of the nasty, noisy negativist, he wouldn't have called him that, but I can, uh, who come up with who came up with explanations uh, like Donald Menzel or Philip Klass that seemed quasi-scientific, uh, ball lightning, plasma balls, uh, temperature inversions. Now, Jim was an atmospheric physicist, and he went at it quantitatively. Unlike Alan Hynek, whom I also knew, Jim was able to destroy these phony explanations. You know, if a temperature inversion explanation required eight degrees of temperature inversion and the weather records say it was two, it doesn't hold. And classes plasma explanations were easily dismissed. And Jim wrote about these things. He put out a whole bunch of these papers, 20 pages or so, small print, double column, some of them, a lot of information. And he spoke, he was the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics lecturer one year, spoke at sections across the country, great crowds. He published two articles in Aeronautics and Astronautics. And the place where I really appreciated him were the congressional hearings of 1968. Jim was the power behind those. Six scientists testified in person, including Jim and Alan Hynek and Carl Sagan and James Harder from the University of California and so forth. My congressman was on the committee that was holding those hearings, and after talking to Jim and checking with Westinghouse first, uh, I was able to submit an article of my testimony to those hearings. It's included in the report, but Jim's paper, which I've been touting ever since, he talks about 41 separate cases it's a 71-page paper in full text, 
I've been selling copies, I'm out of it, so I'm not putting in a promotion here. But I point to it as the best single paper of which I'm aware with lots of good sightings. Multiple witness cases, radar visual sightings, sightings in big cities, sightings by astronomers, meteorologists. Anybody who tells you there are no good reports is first of all full of baloney and second needs to be given a copy of Jim's paper. So I've used his name in my lectures since uh, about 1970. And I have another connection here. I met with him in Pittsburgh, but when Jim died, I had a number of calls from well-intentioned people telling me, the government got Jim and you're gonna be next, Stan, you better watch out. These weren't threatening, they were people who were concerned about my well-being. So I thought I ought to check into what did happen with Jim. The rumors were flying, and I'm sure Betsy heard some of them. I talked to Betsy, I talked to her daughter. I got the, the real story. It was truly a suicide, as far as we know. The government had no role in it, right? Yes. <laughs> and one of the things I was surprised me and pleased me when I got the book to read was that I thought Anne covered his suicide so accurately, so carefully, so well done. And uh, I have always been grateful since the book came out that I can refer people to it. Because I still hear, oh, the government took him out, Stan. The government didn't take him out. It was a great loss to all of us who were serious about ufology. And I'll add one more note. In the, uh, what was his name? Peter Jennings, I think, was his name, did a television show recently. Your good friend. Yeah, my good buddy, yeah. We share the same birthday, and we're both Canadian-Americans, and that's about it, folks. <laughs> uh, anyway, that they would make it sound as if J. Allen Hynek was the light in the wilderness fighting the battle on his own to get the word out, and that was, frankly, baloney. I knew Alan, I knew Jim, there's no question Jim was getting the word out and Alan was not. So that was the final offense. There were other things about the show that you might think I was uh, unhappy about and that would be right, but uh, that one was a, a totally misleading picture. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, he, I'm gonna come back though to some point that he made a little later. Uh, but uh, n next question I wanna give to Brian. Brian, you published the book. The, the, the James's story is out there for a long, long time, uh, but no one really saw or took up the mantle. So give us a little brief uh, description of how, how this book came about. Yes, um, Anne had been working on this for years and years, and uh, she had accumulated a, an enormous amount of information, original documents, all manner of things, uh, through her access to Dr. McDonald's private files. She had a working relationship with Dr. McDonald during these uh, critical years and had been given the permission after he died to go into his files, get out his journals, his notebooks, his everything that he had written, and, and put it together. And she'd been working on this tirelessly for years and years and years. And she finally uh, came to us as uh, publishers in the UFO area and uh, presented this to us. And as I read through it, it was just absolutely clear that you know, two things. One was that this was a, a dusty, dark, unilluminated corner of the history of our fight for truth about UFOs and the alien presence on Earth. There was so much here that needed to be known and was not known. Second thing that was clear to me was we're not going to make any money on this. This is a good book. <laughs> and it's an expensive book. It's uh, $34. We're, uh, we got it on sale for 30 here at the conference. But when she brought it to us, uh, it was clear it had to come out. So we brought it out uh, basically as, as a public service to bring up this man's name in the proper context 
uh, and, and give him some of the rewards that he was so rudely denied during his life. And so we are pleased to bring this out into the world. And I'd like to add a little footnote to the discussion about whether the government did him in. Um, I, I believe he really did kill himself. It was a two-stage process. He shot himself in the eye at one point, went blind, uh, went through another thing, finally uh, did it, and, 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 and Betts tells us that he was very intent on doing this, and I, I believe all that. But from a, another perspective, a little further back, I think one has to roll into the equation the role of the Phil classes and the people who were denigrating his work, embarrassing him, cutting his funding, doing everything they could to make his life miserable. That was, that was part of why he was in the state that led him to what he did. And so I'm not sure who all was behind that, but I can't exonerate all of them. I think there was some responsibility for this that went beyond his own instability, which was definitely there. Uh, quick question. Uh, uh, you want I, to have follow? A, I have Absolutely. a little to add Please. about the book, um, how it started. Um, I was living in Los Angeles, and I met Anne. And Anne had a friend who wanted to do a television show. She wanted to do a show, basically, about how the CIA killed Mac. And so I had to say, well, that wasn't true. Um, the CIA didn't do it. So, uh, but I said, um, and, I, and I don't believe, I don't like the idea of a sen sensational TV show. I said, uh, you know, Anne, a book would be better. And that's how Anne got started on the book. And I helped her through the years, and I did uh, go ed edit everything she wrote. I mean, I, I looked over it and made any corrections. That's what, and I authorized it. That's what the authorization means. So well, that's where, how I the helped her. Where's the co-authorship here? You should be co-author on well, here. Well, she, she said that. She said, <laughs> Betsy, it should be both of us. And I said, no, Anne, you wrote the book. It's you. But I, that's how it did start. I'd like to mention, um, uh, this is not a UFO book, all right? Let's be clear about this. This is not a UFO book. This is a intellectual history, all right, of a very important person in a very important time, all right? And let me tell you, this is, is Paul Davids here? Paul, are you here? He had finished up. He had to go out. This is a movie. All right, this is a movie and a half, and it's got to get done. Don't know how, don't know who'll do it, but someone's going to do that. All right, now I want to I want to turn to something re really important now, Betsy. Um, you and your husband raised six children, and they literally grew up. Tell me that's not me. <laughs> By the way, have I told you to make sure your cell phones are <laughs> It's extremely disruptive when you don't turn those off, so please do that. Um, they literally grew up from the time that they were you know, children, two or three years old, and, and, and grew up through the period that he discovers, gets into, gets uh, deeply involved with, and then exits from this issue. Uh, and I'm sure it must have had a very significant effect on them. How are, how are those children doing today? Tell us a little bit about each one. Well, uh, children don't always follow what their parents do, you know. <laughs> uh, well, um, so my oldest son is a, uh, a physics professor at Princeton, and uh, my second daughter, um, is a, a post office uh, worker in Ukiah. Um, she's also very interested in in, in uh, um, uh, exercises and uh, teaching people health. Um, my third son is a computer uh, worker, as me. Um, my fourth is. A, a teacher, my fifth, um, where was I'm down to Gail, she's a medical doctor, and uh, my sixth uh, is a uh, graphic artist. 
Um, and they're doing well. And they're all doing well. And they're all doing well, yes. They had a happy childhood. Well, they did. I, and the book makes that quite clear. <laughs> Think about this for a second. James McDonald and Betsy McDonald not only gave an incredible contribution to the most important issue, but they raised six highly accomplished, highly educated children who went on to be important adults. Understand how that makes me feel whenever anybody in the mainstream or in the critical debunking world tries to make a point that the people that address this issue in some way are deficient or somehow not capable of discerning properly what's going on and what's not going on. It was always poppycock. It's still poppycock. And I think if you kind of watch things that are happening like the Jennings documentary, you find that their assertions increasingly are obviously ludicrous. And eventually they're going to go away altogether. Now, uh, another question, Betsy. Do you, 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 you were an activist who took up some interesting and difficult causes. You are what would be, uh, Rush Limbaugh would consider you fairly left of center, all right? If you were active today, probably Rush would be talking about you on a regular basis. You were a very strong person in terms of human rights, in terms of peace, anti-war. You even went so far as to support socialism, which in, which in, in a proper context is quite, quite interesting. I, I, I kind of like it. And there's a certain amount of it in Canada, and Canada gets more appealing to me all the time. But you, 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 you were... Yeah. Take that flag with you. <laughs> you, you. But you know what it's like to, to, to take on the causes, you know, the Quixotean uh, mm. cause where you're kind of up against the state and a lot of people are against you. Your husband went through the same thing, right? Was this your karma? <laughs> is, is this, do you feel like you were, that this was the role that you were supposed to play to, to, to take on the great powers and so forth? And, and have you given any thought to getting back in the game? I am in the game. Okay, can you tell us what you tell us? Tell us some things that you're doing <laughs> politically, please, or just in the activism world, anything like that. Uh, well Are you still I causing trouble back there? That's <laughs> what I want to know. Well, I'm a Marxist, and I'm in a, a political party, the Socialist Workers Party, which is a working class party, and uh, I do work on the campus, and I do work in. in um, this party has a press called the Pathfinder Press with 350. Um, uh, books uh, or more, and I work on that project. Uh, it, it's all computerized, and, and there's a lot of work that is involved with that. And I go, I'm on the campus with young socialists. Really? Yes. <laughs> I mean, remarkably, I mean, th th this is a woman remarkably vital, active, uh, right? Uh, Clearly, someone who never, never gave up. Right? Not a question. Let me ask you, as, as someone that, that someone clearly has a strong political perspective that is well to the center, as you've watched America evolve in the last 20, 25 years, do you, do, you, do, you, do you see the emergence of secrecy in these massive security structures? Did you see these kinds of things coming when you were a young activist, and, uh, and how do you view them uh, a, a after all these years? I mean, are these, are these really dangerous? How, how much of a danger do you see that, that, that uh, to, the, to the country and its future? Well, the United States is the major imperialist power in the world, and it has this secrecy, it has this military, you know. So we're all uh, up against it. It's an international question, and um, you know it's the fight. It's the fight we're all in. Uh, one of the previous speaker, speakers talked about how um, to really get the truth out, and so that the public really understands the questions of extraterrestrials. He, he used the term revolution. Yeah. He did. <laughs> well. Uh, that's a Marxist term, too. <laughs> um, it's an interesting point now, isn't it? Because without question, 
all ideologies, particularly those which are intensely and internally focused, okay, which of course is a definition of xenophobia, which has many degrees of, uh, of, of, of uh, intensity, all such internally focused nationalisms and xenophobias would be in an extremely precarious position at the point that all aware human beings on the planet, easily above three billion, four billion, because there's about a billion or so that struggle just to live every day and they have no time for anything else, learn that the galaxy is loaded with civilization. It's awful lot harder to play that internal, inside focused. You have to open up, right? You become global. You become more of a unitary species and a lot of that gets into some of the most powerful ideas that I could, could not obviously be realized uh, in, in a proper fashion in the 20th century that lies behind collectivism, socialism, and so forth. Let's not get into the, idea, the high ideology stuff and some of the, the heavy history. Let's just talk about how we live and how you approach life. So it's possible that disclosure and even contact, you might be back really in the game, Betty, and, uh, and uh, your ideas may suddenly reemerge in a totally new context, but with great power. Because if someone says, no, 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 nationalism, how many, how many people have walked in front of a microphone and said, this is the way it needs to be, and if we do it, it'll last for a thousand years, right? It usually never lasts for more than about 10 years, maybe 70 if they're lucky. We may be dealing with civilizations that have held together for 100,000 years. Stanton, have you got uh, some more thoughts that have come up as we, uh, what would, would you like to add something at this point? I, I visited uh, Betsy my goodness, over 30 years ago, to look at Jim's papers with Richard Greenwell, who was based there in uh, Arizona. And I remember being so impressed that Jim's files were in such great shape. You could find things, he documented stuff, he kept track of things. I mean, he had a secretary at the office, didn't he? Which I didn't, but <laughs> I'm glad my wife didn't see them because she'd give me a hard time about the way my files are. <laughs> Jim was well organized, he was systematic, and he was thorough. I mean, you'd get a case of an airplane crew, a military crew, and he'd talk to every one of the members of the crew. He'd track them down and go after them. And I had to admire that. His tenacity was a model for me, and in a sense influenced my approach to Roswell. Uh, I remember telling Jim that in the Socorro, New Mexico case, a woman had approached me after I spoke to the American Nuclear Society group in Las Vegas that she had been at the university, uh, New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, and she'd been asked to do a secret project on analyzing some glass-like soil that had been found there for the department. So I passed that on to Jim because I was in New Brunswick and, or someplace else anyway. I certainly wasn't in Arizona or New Mexico. And sure enough, Jim followed up on it. He talked to her. He got the information. It turns up in somebody's book, maybe Dick Hall's. I'm not sure whose. But the fact that he would go after things not knowing how they were going to turn out, not knowing whether it was worth the effort, but trying. And I tried to use that as a model in my Roswell research you go after something, you don't know whether that person's got a story for you or not, and even if they have a story, whether they're telling the truth or not, but go for it. That was Jim's approach. Go for it. Check it out. It doesn't always work. Okay, that's the price you pay. But Jim was the, the best example of a serious UFO researcher that I'm aware of, and I've been at this since 1958. I guess that dates me a little bit. But Jim became, uh, for me, a very strong model in how he went at things. And you'll see my comments about it in the first part of the book, the first page inside. Yeah, it's worth noting that uh, a number of researchers were influenced by James McDonald significantly. Uh, Stan Friedman was one of them. Uh, but Robert Wood is another, and Robert Wood is speaking here. 
All right? and, and there were several others. So there's a legacy here that extends well beyond the work of the time. It hasn't stopped. And of course, he will get the proper recognition in time for that. We do affect other people's lives, particularly when we follow an activist path, an action path. Uh, I have always held my highest admirations, not for the people who criticize, certainly, not for the people who sit back and deliberate. Uh, I, I hold my highest regard for the people who act. They sometimes get it wrong, and they sometimes make mistakes. But the people who act are the people that have made this world today, not the people that simply theorized about it. Brian, go ahead. Yes, uh, there's one aspect to James McDonald that becomes very clear in this book, and it's a real example for all of us to learn from. And I, I don't know exactly what word to put on it. Uh, a poor choice of a word would be naive. Um, but there's got to be a better word for it because it came from a high place in, in James. And um, an example of it was when he began to look into the Blue Book Project and the Condon Report and uh, these other um, activities and reports that came out during those days. And he would, he would find, for example, that the conclusions didn't match what was inside the, the uh, reports, that the best um, reports weren't even mentioned, uh, on and on and on, uh, swamp gas, uh, blah, blah, blah. His natural inclination was not cover up and all this stuff. It was there's got to be a foul up here. There's got to be a foul up. Somebody made a mistake here. What, how can we correct this? Okay, here is the real evidence. This is what we need to look at. Let's, okay, let's get science on this. Let's take it to the government. And when he would do that, these invisible walls would rise up and he would be bounced back time and time again. And this foul up versus cover up thing, in my opinion, really emerged through Jim's work it was inevitable coming out of his lifetime of careful deliberation and, and, and experience and evidence and research into all of this uh, information that there had to be something going on other than a foul up. But it was interesting to see how deeply he believed in the sanctity of the US government. My government would not lie to me Science will illuminate the truth here. Let's clean up the foul ups and apply science to the evidence because the evidence is there. Why can't they see the evidence? Why? He didn't understand. And maybe, maybe Betts, you have a few thoughts about his uncertainty about the foul up versus the cover up and where that came from. How did he deal with that? Yeah, he did talk about, is this a foul-up or is it a cover-up? He, he didn't say it outright, it's a cover-up. Um, yeah, he was, he, he was a, a, like a creature. He believed in the philosophy of the Enlightenment days, you know, where if you told the truth and people would, act, uh, would believe it and act on it, the government would act on it. So... Um, that's why some people called him like being like a Don Quixote, you know, because uh, he wasn't uh, understanding how the nature of the the way the government had become, that there was so much uh, 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 cover up of of the of the material. Let's be absolutely clear about this. There is no shame in a citizen of this country believing deeply that their government would not lie about something of great magnitude, of life and death and worldview and creation. The shame is with the government 
that it would ever dare to think that we do not deserve to have the truth and that it's not our right to have it and that they would deny it. That is where the shame is. Right. It is not with those who trust too well. Yes, Mac always thought uh, the people believe in democracy. You know, and so he, that's the way he thought. You know, the people do believe in democracy. They do believe. My great concern is that the day may arrive sooner than we think that they may not believe anymore. Let me ask you, have you, uh, I know we've had seven, eight, I actually have another, we have eight camera crews here uh, doing a lot of interviews. Have, have they interviewed you at all? Have you had one? Paula. Paula interviewed you? Okay. Well, you know, it's very possible that you're going to get some more offers to interview with some of these teams. Are you willing to do a few more tomorrow? If uh, they would like to talk to you? Be okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's take it up the next notch then, uh, Betsy. Uh, it's possible that, you know, you might suddenly become on the, on the radar of some people out there in the media and may want to talk about your husband's life. Um, you think you might be willing to do that on the big screen? Not the big screen, but, you know, I mean, I mean I, if they want to come and talk. I'm not anxious for that. Not anxious for that. Well, you know, it's funny how, you know, when, when that world wants to come to you, they, they sort of show up. But uh, I, I give you a little warning. Beware, right? Because you have a wonderful story to tell, an extraordinary sto story to tell. Wh what is the time right now? What word do we have? 3.34. 3.34. Well, then. Okay. Um, we, have, we have to close because Jaime Masson's presentation is, is uh, very long. Um, uh, Anne is not here. I, th I think there was going to be some books. So uh, the only books are available in the vendor room, but... They're right outside. Oh, but you have some too. You do have some. Okay, yeah. okay, look. Oh, yeah, Cranet Publisher brought a bunch. Mm -hmm. you, you simply have to have this book. You simply have to have this book. If you care about this subject, you have to read this book. Because this, this is the personal, the real. This is where it really matters, okay? Here. You understand this, you will understand truth embargo. You will understand the history. You will understand what people now are going through and why we want to make sure that all those who pursue this issue are able to take it all the way. And there's no possibility that they will be thwarted, that they will ultimately prevail. There's no shame in not prevailing either because he did prevail, as a matter of fact. Uh, many, many great things in this history, in our lives and in history, have happened over many generations. Right? Uh, so uh, there will be a time when he will be acknowledged. But this is the one book I think a person has got to have if they care about the personal part of this. So please, take advantage of this opportunity. Betsy is going to be a little more available, I hope. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe even give her an, I don't know. She, yeah, you have a table. Did I, you have a table out there? You don't have a table. Did I not give you a table? <laughs> oh, she's at Ann Druffel's table. That's right. So she's out at the table. So I'm going to try to get her to hang out at the table. Those of you who have not looked at Marxism appropriately, this is your opportunity. I want you to come up. I want you to get some information. Who, you don't know where things are going right now. Uh, so maybe get a little, little expand your political thinking. But uh, uh, it has been wonderful to have Betsy here. You'll be uh, seeing a little more of her this evening at the banquet. Uh, so let's uh, take a few minutes and then uh, get those tickets because you're going to need them. And please come for the next presentation by Jaime Mossa. Thank you so much for coming.